<clears throat> Good morning. Welcome. If you're visiting with us, we're glad to have you here. Our study this quarter here in the auditorium is an overview of the New Testament. And um, we're doing, each week, we're doing a, a different book of the Bible. Started with Matthew. Uh, K.J. Moore did Matthew, did an overview of the New Testament, and then Matthew specifically our first week. Our second week, um, Justin Spear covered Mark. Last week, um, uh, Eric covered uh, Luke, and this week I'm gonna do John. We're doing each of the books all the way through. Now, if you know how many books are in the New Testament, you know that will not fit into one quarter. So there'll be another quarter uh, right after this where we'll take the, the remaining books that, that we've not covered there. So just to kind of give you some context of, of how this class runs if you've not been here before. <clears throat> Let's begin with a word of prayer, if you bow with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this Lord's Day. We thank you for this time that we have to be able to come and open your word and study from it. Father, we're thankful for the blessing of the Holy Scriptures. We're thankful that the Holy Spirit guided men to put down in writing the things that could be passed on to us to let us know what your will is and to encourage us and to teach us and to motivate us to serve you. Father, be with us this morning as we look at the Gospel of John. May we be encouraged by it. May we be edified. May we increase our knowledge and have some wisdom about what you would have for us to do. Father, we thank you for, for all of the scriptures and we thank you for the one who is featured in these scriptures, Jesus Christ, our Savior. And it's, we thank you for his love and his sacrifice. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. I mentioned that we've, there's four teachers here. It gives us time between each lesson to do some preparation. So I've had some time to be able to, uh, to prepare for this study. You probably noticed too that the average age of our teachers has gone up dramatically today uh, compared to those young guys. I appreciate them, they're smart. I wish I was as, half as smart as they are now. Even, even where I am, but I appreciate them so much. As I got into this particular lesson, I, I got to looking at, okay, what, how am I gonna cover this? And I, let me give you some, some thoughts about how I'm gonna approach this, what I'm gonna do. We're gonna talk about the purpose and the context. Oh, by the way, there are handouts back in the back. Uh, if you did not get one, there'll be some, hopefully there'll be some there after you go back and it'll, it'll cover in detail all the things we're gonna talk about. This is my famous or infamous mind map uh, outline. On, on this one, we're gonna start at the top left, go down this side, go back over to the top right, and go down this side. And pretty much all the information I'm gonna have, I'm gonna have detailed here. On the back side of this is a list of chapter headings from the book of John. Uh, in the Bible Bowl days, long ago, when I remember, before we started Lads to Leaders, one of the things that they did in Bible Bowl was they would memorize all of the chapter headings of a particular book. And that would help them to really know where to look in that particular book if they were looking to, needing to see something. And our kids did a wonderful job of memorizing all these kind of things. I'm not asking you to memorize this list. I'm just telling you, if you want, to, you want some help finding a particular thing in the book of John, it might help you to know what the chapter headings. Many of you have these printed in your Bibles now, and that's a good thing, but I just thought a listing of them might be, might be helpful too. I wanna talk about purpose and context here just a little bit, because I think there's a lot that, at least for me, it helped me understand more about this book than I have before. We're gonna speak a little bit about the author, uh, the audience to whom it was given, and then also some unique characteristics, and there are several unique characteristics to the book of John. Uh, so we're gonna take a look at those, and then I've got a list of key verses that we're gonna go through. And then you see on the back side again, the, the chapter headings. 
I'm going to have to take a sip of water every once in a while. I've been told I'm a liquid-powered windmill. I have to have liquid to be able to make the, the hot air flow here. So uh, that's, the way, that's the way that's going to work. The purpose of the book is actually spelled out in the book. If you look at Matt, uh, John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, you'll see what the purpose of the book is. Now, that's towards the end of the book. Sometimes you would think, well, tell me the purpose up front, but it's told and it's very specific. And especially down in uh, verse 31, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Now, when I just read through that and it's, you know, at, at first glance, I'm thinking, okay, it's all about believing. But let's focus a little bit on believing. Believing is something that we need to do. It's an active thing, not passive. And, and it helps us to have confidence in the truth. When you believe in something, you have confidence that that's true. If, if the person telling you that doesn't have your trust or have your confidence, you may not believe it. Uh, but you need, to, you need to realize that what is being told here in this book, in fact, in all of the books of the New Testament and the Old Testament, we can believe in because it's true and it's from God. Um, but belief by itself is not enough. In James chapter 2, verse 19, it says, even the devils believe and tremble. Believing alone is not enough. It's got to move into action. And so that's what we want to try to do. Now, I want to paint a little context here of, of some things that I studied and read, and I, I don't want to go too far down a deep hole here, but it helped me have a new understanding of some of the things that are part of this. There was also the purpose to help uh, produce faith in disciples who were facing false doctrines. In the first century, there were a lot of false doctrines being popped up and spread around. It seems as though anytime people get together and start talking about things that they'll, they'll run across ideas or thoughts or get together and, and sometimes spawn off of one another and come up with a new idea. And that's what happened quite a bit in the first century. In particular, the group Gnostics. I don't know if you've studied the Gnostics, if you know much about them, but they thought the only way to salvation was through discovering secrets of the universe. Gnostics, the, the word Gnostic comes from the Greek word know, knowledge. And so they thought they needed to have lots of extra knowledge and it was special knowledge. It was secret knowledge. Not everybody could have it. I liken them to people of today who are kind of academics or elites who think the rest of us couldn't possibly understand what they're talking about. Um, they got into mysticism quite a little bit and they got into all kinds of things. They thought that um, spiritual things were important, physical things were evil. In fact, they, there, were, there was so much stuff I looked at this, you can, you can really drive down this. I encourage you, if you're interested, to, to do a deep dive on, on what the Gnostics believed. Roughly, there were, they thought there were seven steps, seven different parts that people had to go through to knowledge to obtain salvation. Um, there was a, a greater God, and then there was a lower God who created the earth, but the earth was evil, so that lower God was not perfect. Just all kinds of, of things that I would characterize as, as maybe crazy. And you would say, well, why, why do you tell me this? The Gospel of John is trying to refute these kind of things, and it's important. Now, there was another group that was a part of this. Actually, they kind of blended together a bit, but the docetism, these were people that did not believe Jesus actually had an earthly body. They thought he was just a, a uh, phantom, if you will, that he was a spirit who came down and appeared he was earthly, but he wasn't. In fact, in one part, all of these had so many subsects of them, and it's crazy, it's hard, to, it's hard to keep up with what they actually did believe. But one of the things about, about the docetism was they thought Jesus was just human. Uh, they didn't believe in the virgin birth. They thought that the Holy Spirit came down onto Jesus uh, as part of God at baptism, 
but that it left him just before the crucifixion so he did not have to suffer on the cross. Now that's what people were thinking about all of this, all this time and come up with things. Uh, in some of the other books of the, of the New Testament, there's references to this. In fact, the Apostle Paul, and there's other books that'll be covering this, but I just wanted to touch on some things to show you that this was not just a one-off concern. The Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter four, talked about myths and endless genealogies and speculations rather than the stewardship of God that is by faith. Rather than having faith in what God tells us in his words, these people were making up all kinds of other stuff. In 2 Timothy, Paul also says, told them, but avoid irreverent babble. I think you could classify some of the things that the, the Gnostics and the Docetes actually did was irreverent battle. Babel. Um, in Titus chapter 1, he talked to Paul again, talked about insubordinate, empty talkers, deceivers, uh, teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach, and, de and devoting themselves to myths. All of this kind of stuff I think fits into this. So it's important that we understand a little bit of the background about what Paul is talking about here. When he says believe, he's talking about let's believe in what God says, not what man makes up and what his, his thoughts are. As far as the author of this book, John the Apostle, there's many things we do know about him. He was a son of Zebedee and Salome. I don't know if I'm pronouncing her name correctly, but uh, Zebedee was a fisherman he was probably pretty well off because it was known that he had some servants. And so James and John, the brothers who were the sons of Zebedee is where they're called. But their mother Salome was also important in the Bible in different, different ways. Uh, Salome was at the crucifixion along with Mary. Uh, she was comforting her. Salome was also one of the ones that went to the tomb to uh, treat the body of Jesus. And uh, she asked Jesus too directly if there could be a special place for her sons uh, when he came to power. Now, I've read some things. This can, I, don't, I can't document this in scripture at all. I can see where the starting of where people come from on this, but again, I think it's speculation. But one of the things that people speculate on is that Salome was a sister of Mary. If that were true, then John would be a cousin of Jesus. We know John was, and we'll see here in just a minute, he was the, the disciple that Jesus loved. Well, if they were cousins, I could see where that could be a, a special relationship there. Um, but they, we don't know that for a fact. And it's, it's I, I put that in the category, that's interesting, but not useful to know whether or not they were sisters. Doesn't change the gospel at all, does it? doesn't change the understanding of what I need to do for salvation. It's interesting, but it's not useful to what we need to do. James and John were called the sons of thunder. Uh, nobody knows for sure that I could see that exactly why Jesus called them that. However, in the book of Luke, in chapter 9, Jesus was headed back to Jerusalem. They were going through Samaria, and the Samaritan town that they came to rejected him, said, you can't stay here. You're on your way to Jerusalem. Samaritans and the Jews did not get along at all. And so he was rejected. Well, James and John had a solution. They came to Jesus and said, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? They were ready to destroy them with fire from heaven. I could see where that might lead to a title of sons of thunder. Can you? Possibly. Um, they were fishermen too. They were they were probably loud and boisterous. You had sometimes out on the sea, you had to, you had to get loud. You had to talk loud to, to get heard from people. Um, they were from Capernaum, which is, you can see on the, the map there, I put a little arrow. Uh, it's on the northwest kind of side of the Sea of Galilee. A lot of the work that Jesus did was up on that northern edge of the Sea of Galilee. And a lot of his early ministry was there. And so these, these guys were from that, from that particular region. And uh, 
knew their way around that, that area quite well. Some other things about John. He attended the crucifixion. He was there. His mother was there. He was there as well. John was also asked by Jesus or told by Jesus, behold your mother, take care of her, basically, was what he was saying. And John agreed to do that. So he took care of Jesus' mother after Jesus died. His, Jesus' earthly father had already been passed away, according to tradition. So his mother was alone, but not after Jesus asked John to care for her. Um, he was often referred to as the apostle whom Jesus loved. There was a special affinity uh, between them. He was an eyewitness to many things, which we're going to see here in just a minute, um, but especially the death of Jesus. Now, for someone who is described as the one who, whom Jesus loved, what do you suppose his reaction was at the cross of seeing Jesus nailed, ridiculed, spit upon, his side pierced, having a conversation with him on his cross, and then watching that, that occur. That had to hurt to the depths that, that it's hard to understand. Now, we know grief. We, when we've lost loved ones, we know grief. But this is also a deep, deep grief that I think comes out in uh, some of his writings. And we'll see some of that a little bit later on. He was part of the inner circle of Christ. Um, Peter, James, and John, they were three of the first four apostles that Jesus called. Uh, but Jesus included them in many things that some of the other apostles did not get included on. Uh, they were at the transfiguration when Jesus went up on the mount and was transfigured there. They were eyewitnesses to that. That's some powerful stuff there. Uh, John also wrote uh, not only the Gospel of John that we see here, but the letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and then he wrote Revelation. And so he had several, not as many as the Apostle Paul had, um, but he, he wrote several things there. Uh, the Transfiguration, if you're interested in, in seeing a little bit more about that, you can read about that in Matthew 17, also Mark 9 and Luke 9. There's an account of the Transfiguration where they, they were together there. Now, I don't know about you. When I was young, I used to think, I don't know why I thought this, but I used to think, well, the books of the Bible, the New Testament, they were written in order and we have them in that order. Not true. They were written in various times. And here is a list. I realize a little tough to see, but uh, I put blue arrows by the Gospels. The book of Mark was written in about 50 to sit. Now, these are best guess estimates. I didn't come up with this list. I copied it from somebody else who's hopefully smarter than, than I am. I'm sure they are. Um, but Mark in about 50 or 60 AD, Matthew in about 50 or 60 AD, those came first. Then you see the book of Luke probably in about 60 to 61. But then we look over at the book of John and it's between 80 and 90. John was only one of the apostles who was, did not live, did not die a martyr's death. He, he lived well into his 90s, maybe nearly to 100. Uh, but he didn't do his writing until much, much later. I uh, don't know why that is, but the Gospel of John is a supplement to the other Gospels. It is not to be laid right side by side and you see everything exactly the same. We refer to Matthew, Mark, and Luke as the synoptic Gospels. Synoptic. You do a synopsis of something, you kind of give an overview, a big picture. What if all of the details of Jesus' life were written? Um, we're told in Scripture the books wouldn't hold all of it. So there are synopsis of things, but they're very parallel. In fact, if you've got access to a parallel gospel or you go online and look up, you can find many of the accounts of the gospels in each Matthew, Mark, and Luke, lay them side by side and you'll see a lot of similarities. Now we pick up on details in different ones that we don't see 
in Matthew, you'll pick up on some details in Mark and Luke and, and vice versa. But the book of John was not designed to be able to tell us the same story in the same way and confirm all of those. The book of John had different things and it left out a whole lot of stuff that you find in the first three gospels uh, that we have. Um, you can see too that, that the gospels were written over a period of time. By the way, all during this time that they were written, all of these heresies of people who were um, Gnostics and the Docetums and many other things, people were, were coming up with false teachings and figuring out things on their own. Um, we lost my place there. Doesn't matter, I got so much material, we won't need it anyway. Um, the audience that each of the books was aimed at different audience. Matthew aimed at the Jews and the genealogy was important for the Jews to understand. Mark was mainly to the Roman world. And, and by the way, everything that, that Christ was born into the Roman empire, all of the, the Judea and all the, the areas that, that he traversed was part of the Roman empire. So Romans were, it was important. Luke was primarily for Gentiles. Luke, by the way, was not one of the apostles, uh, but he wrote primarily to a Gentile audience. But John wrote to everyone, and he wrote it probably, if he wrote it in 80 or 90, let's say early 90, it's probably 60 years beyond the time that the church was established on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter two, which we'll see next week. And then also uh, 40, 30, 40 years after some of the other uh, gospels. So it was, it was for people who already had heard the gospel, obeyed the gospel, were trying to understand how to live as Christians but they were getting messed up with all of these people who had false teachings. So this was for a universal audience. And the universal audience includes us. All of these are important for us, but these, these uh, warnings against false teachers are good for us today. Even though the, the Gnostics basically died out uh, years ago, um, there, there have been some Gnostic gospels. I don't know if you've heard about those, but in 1945, in uh, Egypt, they discovered the Nag Hadami Library, which was extra gospels that did not make it into the Bible. Well, they were Gnostic gospels. You had things like the Gospel of Judas, who apparently had a secret understanding with Jesus and knew things that the other apostles did not know. That's crazy. You had the Gospel of Mary. You had the Gospel of... of uh, well, there are several other Gospels. In fact, there was even a secret book of John. John may have heard about this and may have been one of the reasons why he was refuting and disputing all of this kind of stuff. Let's talk about some of the unique characteristics of um, this particular book. He leaves out several things. He leaves out the genealogy of Jesus, partly because it was already known. You could find it in the other Gospels. He wasn't trying to convince anybody in this particular case to obey the gospel. He was trying to convince them of other things. And, but the genealogy was often used to convince people that Jesus was, was truly the Messiah. It doesn't talk about Jesus' birth. It doesn't talk about his youth, the time in the temple. Uh, it doesn't describe his baptism or the temptations. Even though John was at the transfiguration, he does not cover it in his book. And he does not talk about the ascension, which he was also there. So he leaves out a lot of stuff. And I, I think sometimes people may say, well, how is it a gospel if it leaves out all that other stuff? It's the good news of Jesus and we'll see some of the things that it does include to help uh, encourage people. It does not record the Sermon on the Mount as we see in, in the other gospels. It does not include parables. We learn a lot from parables, don't we? Parables are very helpful to common people to understand things. He doesn't cover them. 
He also does not cover prophecies about the destruction of Jerusalem or the destruction of the end of the world. So you look at this list of two things here that we've covered on these slides, you say, well, what did he talk about? What did he cover? Well, he covered a lot. And we're gonna to try to touch on some of these things pretty quickly. Oh, he made, he made no mention of the, of the church um, because he was not trying to establish new congregations here. He talked very little about repentance because he wasn't trying to convince people to obey the gospel originally, he was trying to teach them to uh, continue uh, in, in faithfulness. Some of the important words that you can pull out of this uh, book, the word father 124 times, but I highlighted know and believe 94 times and 93 times. I think this was put right in the face of the Gnostics. They said, you know, the only way to have salvation is you have to know things. You have to have a special knowledge. Well, John says, you can know this. And he talks about 94 times. And he talked about belief the 93 times or variations of that. Know and believe. What he's telling people here in this gospel is I'm showing you what you should already know from the other gospels and maybe other books that you've read. But you can know and believe the scriptures because they're from God. Anything that's not from God directly or through the, through the words that the Holy Spirit guided, that's, that's not worthy. Uh, many other things he, he talks about there, truth 27 times. It's important that we focus on what's true. Now you say, okay, you told us all the stuff he didn't talk about. What did he talk about? Well, those are some good questions. There were seven signs that he described that talked about the power and the authority of Jesus. First one, water into wine in John chapter two. Remember the, the wedding feast? This shows his power over quality because the, the person at the feast came up and said, why did you save the best wine for last? That's the wine Jesus made. They were serving wine before, but the quality got better when Jesus came in and touched it. And his mother said, whatever he tells, him, tells you to do, do it. That's, that's important. She understood his power, I believe. The nobleman's son in John 4, when he came and asked, can you, can you heal my son? And, and Jesus did it from a distance. He did not have to go and touch the boy or see the boy. He healed him by just saying the words. The lame man in John chapter 5 this shows his power over time. This man had been lame since birth. All his life he'd been lame. Now sometimes it's hard to recover from something, even just a, an acute injury. Sometimes we may twist an ankle or something. That takes a while for us to, to recover from. Jesus instantly healed this man, did not take a long recovery time, plus, this was something the guy had lived with all his life and instantly it was, it was taken away. The feeding of the 5,000. He took the loaves and the fishes, the very few that he had, and he blessed it and broke it and fed the 5,000 people talked about here. It's his power over the quantity. It was a quantity of just a few loaves and fish and yet he filled, fed 5,000 people. And they took up extras because there was leftovers walking on the water in chapter six. It was his power over the natural law. Nobody walks on water today. Nobody did until Jesus did. Now Peter asked to and he got out there and he did it, but then his faith, he started looking around and he started sinking. But Jesus had the power for him and for Peter to be able to do that natural law. Healing of the blind man, again, power over disease. The guy had been blind for quite some time. And then we saw in the uh, uh, John chapter 11, where he raised Lazarus from the dead. That was power over death. That's kind of a precursor of what we will see him actually have power over death in his own resurrection. But he started doing it early on. So these are seven ways that he describes that you can trust and you can believe in what Jesus said because of his power and his authority and don't let others draw you away from that. 
There are also seven, seven I am statements of Christ, where he said, I am, and then he described it using something. Use some very common items for us to be able to understand what he was talking about. When he said, I am the bread of life. All of us understand how important bread is. We need bread, we eat bread. We can stay alive on bread and water if we have to. We don't want to, but we could. Bread is essential to life. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. In a spiritual sense, but still uh, important understanding. The light of the world. Fortunately for us, we have light in this world. If we did not have light, things would not grow. We would not be able to get around. We would not be able to see we'd all be basically blind men. And that's, that's not something that we want to have in this world. He said, I'm the door. We all understand doors. We all came through doors this morning. It's an entrance, it's a way in. It's the way you, you get to inside of where you wanna be. He was talking about being into Christ, into the, uh, the kingdom of God. He was the good shepherd. A shepherd takes care of his sheep. In fact, a shepherd will die for his sheep, which Jesus proved he was willing to do, and he did it. But after that, too, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He was willing to die. He did die, but he was also the resurrection, and he was the life. And he, because of his resurrection, we look forward to that resurrection ourselves because we, too, someday, if we're obedient to Christ, in this life, we can have assurance of a resurrection to be with him for eternity. In John 14, he says, I am the way, the truth, the life. People often ask for directions. Tell me exactly how I need to get someplace. He is. He says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. If you'll follow my will, follow my instructions, you'll get to where you want to be. And then the last one we have reference here is in John 15, I'm the true vine. It's a connection. Uh, fruit has to be connected to the, to the vine, the tree, in order to survive. We have to be connected to Christ in order to survive uh, different things here. Now I realize I've, I've gone pretty fast and covered, covered quite a bit of stuff. Any comments, questions at this point? I've got several key verses to go through here too uh, that we're gonna, we're gonna take some time to go through, but okay. Some of the key verses that, and this is not an exhaustive list, it's just when I look at the time and how much I could, could get into the, to the lesson, it was, it was limited. But I wanna start with John 1.1. 1, 1. He starts this just like the book of Genesis starts, in the beginning. I find that very interesting. Only in the beginning, he goes back before Genesis. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Was God before anything. And then in verse 3, uh, describing the Word, without Him was not anything made that was made. You go back to Genesis, and it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This verse says, before that was the Word, and the Word was there when everything was made. If you want to know the beginning of something, go back to the real beginning, and that was before uh, Genesis even happened, before God revealed to us what happened there. Another key verse, well, it goes along with this, and this is the one that really fly, hits the the docetism in the face because it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. See, they did not believe that Jesus had a physical body. They thought it was just an apparition and that he didn't, he didn't live and, and experience all the things we did physically. They, in fact, they thought that was a, uh, in their views, from what I, what I understand, they thought that anything physical was evil. Anything that was tangible, physical, there was a spiritual side and there was a physical side. And the physical side was all evil and the spiritual side was all good. So how could God 
have a physical side. That's evil. Couldn't happen in their mind. Well, from our understanding, he came and became flesh and dwelt among us, and he experienced all the things we experience. He experienced temptation, but he did not sin. He, he hurt like we did. He had physical pain. We know that from the crucifixion, from the cross. We know several different situations where Jesus experienced what we experienced. In fact, I think even more so because of his, his unique position. This goes directly in the face of the, of the Docetus and the Gnostics because they didn't believe that he was actually physical. John 3, 16. This is probably one of the most quoted verses, Bible verses, in the world. You see this on television at sporting events sometimes. Some guy with a wig that's got several different colors holding up a sign, John 3, 16. And it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. It's it's important that we understand that this is, this is not just about belief only. Because we said before, belief leads to action. This is a verse that can be pulled out of context. Say, see, all you got to do is believe and you'll be saved. That's not true. That's not what this is aiming at. I find it interesting, too, so God, for God so loved the world. He was very close to Jesus. In fact, the, the apostle that Jesus loved. He was surrounded by love in his life from God, from Jesus. He went from being called an apostle who was a son of thunder to later in his books, he's called the apostle of love. Love one another. How many times did he say that? We'll see in some of his other books as we study them uh, in the next quarter because they'll all come down towards the end of the New Testament. But he was the apostle of love and he talked about God's love here. Very, very important verse. If we believe on him and truly believe, not like the devils who believe and tremble, but we believe and take action, we're going to be obedient. And that is where we will not perish but have eternal life. Another key verse, uh, for John 4, 24. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Now, I suspect that the, the Gnostics and the Docetists probably took a little bit of this and tried to spin it and twist it to say, well, see, that's why the physical is not good. That's why we don't, we think that's evil because you got to worship in spirit. Um, it's true, but we have a physical body and we need to treat it properly because it is the temple of the spirit and we, we need to, to honor that that uh, gift that we have and that, that life that God has given to us. Again, verses, uh, John chapter 10, verses 9 through 11, he talks about the door. He talks about being living life and having life abundantly. Jesus did not intend for us, his followers, to always be paupers, to never have anything. Now, he didn't promise us riches that we would be kings and rulers of the world, but he also didn't tell us that we have to live in the gutter and in the streets and not have anything. We're going to have abundance. See, John had abundance in love, too. And if you've got abundance in love, there's going to be a whole lot of other things that become a part of your life that are very, very important. And he talks about the good shepherd, uh, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. We talked about that a while ago, and Jesus did just exactly that in his life. The next one's a big one. Jesus wept. I remember as a kid, sometimes in, in Bible classes, we'd have a, somebody say, Quote a Bible verse for me. John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. That was my memory of what I could say. Shortest verse in the Bible. Word wise, not meaning wise. The meaning of this says that Jesus had emotions. This was when Lazarus had, had died. 
I hear strange noises and I'm not anywhere near done. Uh, he was fully human, but he was fully God. He had the emotions and we need to, need to realize that about him. He understands us better than we understand ourselves because he experienced the same things. Uh, John 14, verse 1, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. You hear that talked about a lot. There's many other things here, but that part is pretty famous. We don't need to be troubled because when we believe in God, we can have confidence, we can have faith, we can have the trust. He goes on to describe what's prepared for us uh, where, where we will eventually be with him. In verse 21, or chapter 21, verse 25, uh, it says, Now there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them written, I suppose the world would not contain the books that could be written. All of, in fact, the entire Bible, if you think about it, is very brief. It can describe major events in history in just a very few words. Sometimes it doesn't take much to give us the idea. God, God told us what we need to know. And if, if current modern day people were writing, the, the Bible would be much bigger because we wouldn't have the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and we'd start putting in our own little editorials and all those kind of things, I believe. So it is true that we've got what we need to understand and to believe, which brings us back to the purpose of the book was for us to believe. God wants us to believe. John wanted his hearers of this particular letter to believe the things that were already known to them by the most part and things they could know from scripture and not be pulled aside by all the false teachings that were going on uh, in, the, in the day and age that, that he was there. Any, uh, any thoughts or comments at this point? It's a way to kill a discussion is ask for questions. Huh? Uh, as I said, this is an overview. You, I, we weren't trying to go deep diving into everything. I will tell you though that this, I've spent several weeks now knowing after I got the assignment that I was gonna teach this particular uh, book I went through and looked at a lot of different things and I would encourage you not to just read a book, but to really study a book. And to study a book takes time. And there are some resources that you can use. In fact, I wanna show you something. This is a picture of a room that many of you may not, not even know exists. It's right back in the foyer, just off to the left, just before you go out the door. This is our library. On the left-hand picture is a wall full of reference books, commentaries, gospel dictionaries, all kinds of things, things that you can come and study. You can check out some things. There are some things that we're, we don't check out because we have a limited number of them, but there's a little card you can sign. You can check things out if you need. If you don't have the resources of your own, you can check those. On the right-hand side are books by different authors. It's listed in alphabetical order of the author and it's topical. Things about church growth and church planning and finance and Christian parenting and just countless numbers of things. There are some, uh, there's one biography in there that I've checked out and read about a, a gospel preacher who was in the uh, frontier days of Texas. It's a big, thick book. But man, it was fascinating to me to learn a little bit about how circuit preachers in those times, what their life was like and how pitifully little they were paid. That's kind of something that may not have always changed. But I encourage you to make sure that you use resources and you find things that can help you in your study. If you've got access to the internet, you've got a, a boundless boundless measure of things that you can, you can find and, and use for study. But again, John's purpose for this was to help us to believe. I uh, Hopefully we've talked about some things here. Use this sheet if you're looking through the book of John. If you wanna find something in particular, maybe help, help you zero in on which chapter, really dig down and don't just read it, but study it, meditate and think about it and uh, take your time.
to learn. Next week, our brother Eric will be talking about the book of Acts. And then the week after that, I'll be talking about the book of Romans. So we're, we're making our way through the New Testament as we go. Thank you all very much for your attention. I appreciate it.